for followers. So after we got so many positive feedbacks for the last video we made on how to dress your cat appropriately for the funeral of your dead husband, we thought we would do something similar this week. So we're gonna deal with 19th century imperialism. Exactly, it's time for Africa. So, in the 19th century, European nations took imperialism to new heights, as many European countries, including France, Britain, Germany, Belgium, Italy, and Portugal, had colonized large parts of the world and almost 90% of Africa by 1900. However, European imperialism actually started way before that. Already in 1450 to 1815, Spain and Portugal began acquiring colonies overseas in the Americas, Africa, India and Southeast Asia and were later followed by Holland, France and Britain. These colonies were either uh, white settlements, plantations, where slave laborers worked for the European masters or simply trading bases. The countries lived very well alone and individually and many ethnicities were thriving until came Knock knock, it's Europe. The real consolidation and conquest began in the 1890s when Germany, Italy and Belgium had joined the party and the things in Europe were heating up a little. As some historians argue, it was due to financial reasons, so trade, overseas investments and potential expansion of markets. However, as we are more certain nowadays, quote, they sought to acquire prosperous territory on the continent of Africa for the purpose of ameliorating the prestige of the country against that of their European neighbors. So basically, they did it for the fame. Colonies have become the status symbol of any great power. And also, Africa was treated as their new playground to display rivalries and form alliances. As Bismarck quoted, my map of Africa lies in Europe. That meant, instead of letting all the diplomatic quarrels escalate on your continent, you chose to move them to Africa, which was, after all, at a relative safe distance from your own borders. But then, most European countries just thought it's time for Africa. The so-called scramble for Africa describes this process of how Africa was separated into and became many more colonies, and it all began in Egypt. It was under joint rule of both France and Britain following its bankruptcy in 1878. But the European, but the Egyptian people were not entirely happy with the fact that they were being ruled by France and Britain, so they started rioting against the occupational forces due to a strong sense of nationalism. This threatened the safety of the Suez Canal, which was important to Britain and France, but meant a lot more to France as they had built it originally. It was crucial for Britain's trade with India. Continued Egyptian military operations elsewhere gradually exhausted financial resources and after having been denied an international loan by the Russian and French delegates of the Responsible Commission, Britain turned to Germany to consolidate her sole rule over Egypt. In exchange to that, Germany demanded the right for its own African colonies. With time, France's importance increased as she had become a considerable naval power and more dominant in trade. Britain saw this as a threat as they wanted to be the greatest, most fabulous country in Europe. This was shown in West Africa in the 1880s, when two French trading companies appeared in the Niger Delta, which has always been Britain's hood, you might say. Such intensified Anglo-French rivalry, and Britain was quick to make some treaties with local chiefs to ensure their dominance. Great Britain then declared the region of Niger formally to be under British protection. Another provocation was France's expansion into West Sudan by building a railway network between Senegal and Nigeria, which seemed financially promising at first, but failed miserably. France still benefited from that as it created a large French empire in West Africa, and hence successfully asserted their dominance and influence on the continent and consolidated their position as a colonial power. But France wasn't the only country behaving like a total douchebag back then. Pretty, pretty much everyone was. As Congo was exceptionally rich in resources and therefore attractive to European nations, and as we know, the white people back then liked to exploit really rich areas. <clears throat> King Leopold of Belgium became very interested in Congo. He created an international association to open up the region, which was actually a moneymaker disguised as a scientific or humanitarian something to get to the fancy ivory and rubber. Some of the local chiefs were falling for this scam and gave the association territory, 
But then France, the drama queen, once again whooshed in because she claimed possession over some of them, which created tension. Britain then was like, yo, French bro, chillax, we'll take the regions away from the International Association by recognizing Portugal's shadowy claims. But then France and Germany were like, no way, brah, we oppose such private arrangements. And because... These countries were not able to solve this issue all by their own, as they were small kindergarten children behaving like. They needed an international conference, which took place in Berlin from November 1884 to February 1885, and was therefore called the Berlin Conference. Several agreements were the outcome of this conference, attempting to calm down the situation. Firstly, very generally, it recognized European claims in Africa. Secondly, it laid down the ground rules for further partition of regions, meaning claims needed to be precise and there should be tangible signs of a country's presence where required for making such. Thirdly, the Congo was recognized as a sovereign state, which the French did not like. And fourthly, Germany formalized her dominance over Togo, the Cameroons, German East and Southwest Africa. And last but not least, a doctrine of effective occupation was put into place for the purpose of stopping Britain's vague claims over large parts of Africa. The colonial rivalries also created unexpected bonds between the European powers. For example, for example co a cooperation of the neighbors France and Germany to piss off Britain together. How about a Franco-German cooperation to piss off the tea sippers? I have enough of their arrogance and unwillingness to negotiate about Southwest Africa. Oh, that is an idea incredible! I am still mad for the exclusion from Egypt and want revenge. Thanks. Seems like a common enemy brings us closer together. Making the claim now to anger Britain? Yep, it may be their preserve, but I need to defend my country's interests. Bismarck would maybe have discussed it with Jules Ferry, the French Prime Minister of France. But everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Uh, 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 wrong intro. I meant to say matters got even worse for Britain when gold was discovered in South Africa in 1886. Because South Africa would then become rich. So Britain began to fear the natives would question their rule upon acquiring vast amounts of wealth. The solution for that was Cecil Rhodes. Uh, a girl's name? Whatever. He was an Englishman who made a fortune out of diamond mining. In October 1889, he convinced the British government to give him basically his own country, which he very uncreatively named Rhodesia. His country strengthened British rule in southern Africa and acted as, as a counterweight to the Boer Republic of the Transvaal, without the British government having to pay for anything. Germany and Britain were also bitching at each other for East Africa in the 1880s, as Germany proclaimed East Africa under German protectorate and called it German East Africa in 1885. I tell you, man, people back then were really not creative in coming to naming their colonies. Yes, we're looking at you, Rhodesia. This created a shit ton of tension, which they tried to resolve through a treaty in 1886, which did not work, so they needed a second treaty. The treaty which became known as the Heligoland Zanzibar Treaty in 1890, which was much more beneficial for Britain. But Britain was like that one bully on the playground who always picked a fight when it came to African colonies. Which is why Britain again got into a beef with France. It began when Italy attempted to dominate West Africa and the Nile Valley by colonializing Ethiopia and Eritrea. The greatly underestimated Ethiopians' army and were therefore defeated by them in 1886. Italy realized that the Italian Empire in West Africa ain't gonna happen and Germany began fearing for their own pizza-making states, pizza-making mates. They thought the Italian monarchy might crumble like an overbaked cookie if another setback should occur. In 1898, the French captain Marchand was feeling really risky and led his forces to Fashoda in the Upper Nile to gain control of the Upper Nile River Basin and thereby exclude Britain from the Sudan and Egypt. Britain was definitely not amused and refused to make any kind of compromise, finally pressuring France to with withdraw from the territory, which they did in November 1898 as the crisis may have led to a war. Such France was not prepared to risk, as military they were inferior to the British, which in the long run however led to the realization that they needed the friendship of Britain in case of a Franco-German war. 
Nowadays, the dispute and subsequent diplomatic victory is widely considered to have been the precursor of the Entente Cordiale in 1904. In the meantime, Britain was still fearing for its own rule over South Africa, as the Boer were still not chill about them being there. Britain feared that Germany could swoosh in and support the Boer against them, and therefore made a deal with Germany. As Portugal wasn't really good at handling her finances, Britain was sure that Portugal was going to lose Angola and Mozambique, and therefore promised these territories to uh -huh, Germany. In exchange, of course, that Germany did not support the Boer, and, was still, and this made them one step closer to a central African empire. But a war against the Boers still broke out, and it was harder to win than expected. The press coverage showed that the unpopularity of Britain back then in Europe was very large, and the rivals came up with a plan. <coughs> they were like, let's create a continental league against Britain. Then, however, they looked at the huge navy of Britain and thought, ah, nah, how about no? And in 1911, when Italy seized Tripoli and caused trouble in Turkey, the powers did not intervene as they did not want to weaken the sick man of Europe any further. From 1902 to 1914, the tensions in Africa decreased and there was less drama going on. Only North Africa was still a source of Franco-German rivalry between 1905 and 1911, when Germany in both cases attempted to claim Morocco as theirs. In conclusion, so, for us, Imperialism in Africa serves to foreshadow the clashes in World War I with Britain having managed to resolve her initially tense conflicts with France and, in regard to Asia, with Russia in 1904 and 1907 respectively. Both France and Britain pursued a policy of brinkmanship but eventually found a way to compromise. In contrary, Germany started out on good terms with both countries However, her anti-British and between 1905 and 1911, especially anti-French position in Africa, increasingly isolated the country towards the end, leaving it where it started, in between two great powers, Russia and France.